Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to High Park this afternoon. And thanks, of course, to Alexander Daisy Ginsburg for accepting the invitation to have a conversation here in uh, the park about the Pollinator Pathmaker project, this extraordinary project which uh, we will continue with the Serpentine and the Royal Parks. It's a long duration project. We're going to talk about that later. We feel that it's very important as an art institution to think about uh, La Longue Durée, you know, about what Fernand Baudel called La Longue Durée, about long durational projects uh, to go beyond event culture and think about projects which can, you know, have longer duration. That is, of course, reflected in so many artists' practices right now, who are artists who work on gardens, uh, like you do. We can also mention, of course, Precious Okoyaman. And, you know, many artists these days work on this idea of the garden uh, as, a, as a medium. We have also many artists working on farms. Um, of course, Gianfranco Barrucello has been doing it for a long time. More recently, Inca Shonibare, with whom we're going to work at the Serpentine in spring, has started a farming project in uh, Nigeria. Um, Otobong Nekanga, uh, also Arian Villa Rojas, and many more. So this idea of farms and gardens bringing in another time horizon, which is not the time horizon of an event uh, or of uh, an exhibition. Together with Bettina Korek, our CEO at the Serpentine and all our teams. We're incredibly excited to revisit today with Alexander Daisy Ginsburg, the pollinator pathmaker, um, a collaboration with the Royal Parks. Um, it's funded by the Serpentine with support from Nicoletta Fiorucci Foundation. Many thanks go to Nicoletta, also to Google Arts and Culture. And it's an original commission actually by the Eden Project, funded by Garfield Weston Foundation. Uh, there is also support from the Gaia Art Foundation uh, and the many collaborators, as mentioned, from Google Arts and Culture. I want to thank you, particularly the Serpentine Dream Team, who worked on this project and on today's talk. Uh, Costa Sazinopoulos, Sarah Ahmed, Eva Specht, Jordan Page, Lou Ruggett, uh, and Andy Downey. Many thanks go also to Melissa Blancheflower and Rebecca Lewin, to Andy Williams, to the Royal Parks team, as well as Ferry Barnes, Ruby Dixon, and of course, also the dream team at uh, Alexander Daisy Ginsburg studio. Uh, it's been such a teamwork. So I think we should give these amazing teams a big round of applause. <laughs> and as mentioned, you know, the long-term dimension of this project uh, makes it part of Back to Earth, which is our long-term environmental initiative to address the climate emergency. It's not only uh, a project about uh, the climate emergency, but it's hopefully also a catalyst for change and uh, climate change is here to s actually, and, 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 and uh, we have to transform society and reach climate safety. And in order to do so, we need you know, new strategies, also new artistic strategies. And that has been at the very core of uh, Alexander Daisy Ginsburg practice for a long time. And uh, for us from the beginning, it was clear that we wanted to collaborate. We also collaborated on the book, Remember Nature, but it's a dream come true that we can have for many years here this pollinator pathmaker experiment. It's a really one of a kind experiment in interspecies art. It's also exciting that actually a um, twin project has just opened in Berlin uh, to this garden here at the Natural History Museum. So for those of you who will be in Berlin uh, in the future, you can experience it uh, there. Uh, and of course, for both projects, um, uh, you worked with horticulturalists at the Eden Project in Cornwall, with pollinator scientists, with experts to really curate a database of plants that supports pollinator populations uh, local to the side of the artwork. So in this, in this sense, it's of course a very, very different project in Berlin than it is here, and we're hopefully going to hear about it uh, uh, from you more. It was also fascinating before when I asked you, because we looked at the garden and um, I pass by the garden very often in the morning when I go jogging. Uh, so I very often see how many bees and uh, bumblebees and pollinators actually interact. And I was asking you, you know, if they do have uh, a preference. Uh, and the interesting thing is that there are only plants here the pollinators prefer. So they're all preferred plants of the pollinator. Uh, it's an amazing work. It's a very multidisciplinary work, and that is very much at the core, of course, of your practice also with synthetic aesthetics. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the book, I recommend this book very much. Alexander Daisy Ginsburg's book, Synthetic Aesthetics, Investigating 
Synthetic Biology's Design on Nature. It's published by MIT Press. Then in 2000, in 2014, actually, then in 2017, there is the PhD better at the Royal College of Art, where you actually interrogated how powerful dreams of um, better futures shape uh, the present. So these, a couple of references to literature, if you want to know more about the work. And of course, I also want to mention here that uh, recently the Pollinator Pathmaker has been awarded the s and Arts Gra Gr Grand Prix Grand Prize for Artistic Exploration. It's a, a large-scale initiative of the European Commission uh, and many congratulations to you on this uh, amazing award. So now before we start, please join me in giving Alexander Daisy Ginsburg a very warm welcome. <laughs> and I wanted to kind of begin with the beginning and ask you a little bit about the conception of the project and how you kind of arrived at the idea of creating a living artwork for pollinators and maybe also how it evolved out of some previous of your works, which in a similar way had very much a, a long-term perspective, no? So I think we should also thank the pollinators. Can everyone hear me? Okay, yeah. So we need to thank the pollinators and the plants who are here as well. We should applaud them. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it's strange, they're actually the audience, so we're watching them and they're very much part of this. So the, the work began with a commission or an invitation to work with the Eden Project in Cornwall, which is an ecological attraction. And they wanted me to bring attention to the jeopardy facing pollinators. So the insects that we rely on to pollinate our crops and our ecosystems and numbers are falling dramatically. So in Germany, for example, 75% decline by volume of flying insects in the last 30 years. So it's a, a crisis caused by pesticides and habitat change and climate change. But I thought it was nuts to make something about pollinators uh, outdoors, and it would be more interesting to make something for them. So I proposed making an artwork for pollinators, and then I had to figure out what that actually meant. And this is the result. So I started looking at how insects see the world. How can we put ourselves in the perspective of other organisms and ask how they might enjoy art and what art is for them? So this is an outdoor talk, <laughs> so the, all the elements are joining us. Um, so I propose making an algorithm to actually design the gardens or living artworks so that my aesthetic choices didn't get in the way. And the project was conceived in April 2020, just at the beginning of the pandemic. And it seemed important to me that as we were all locked in our homes and seeking access to nature, that there was a way to think about moving beyond that. So the web tool that's part of it, which I think we're going to talk about more, sort of yeah. came out of that, that idea as well. So how can it not just be one artwork? How can we think about a multiplicity of connected artworks? And we just opened uh, the exhibition, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, of uh, Gabriel Massan and collaborators at the North Gallery. And uh, of course, that work with um, technology, it's a, it's a video game, which also connects very much to the um, environment. And it's actually very much part, we can say, of our entire season. Uh, I was actually thinking if it would start to rain. Um, I remember once many years ago, we did a talk in the rain. It was like in this Marcel Brotas film, the notes all of a sudden, you know, started to get blurry and the ink <laughs> and everything. And I was just saying you know, that our summer season has really a theme this year. If you think about the uh, Gabriel Massam project with the many collaborators about the Thomas Saraceno show, The Pavilion, your garden, it all has to do with what Alexis Pauling Gumbs says so beautifully that we have the opportunity now as a species fully in touch with each other to unlearn and relearn our own patterns of thinking and storytelling in a way that allows us to be actually in communion with our environment mm -hmm. as opposed to a dominating colonialist separation from the environment. And um, in a way, what these projects also have in common is that they have to do with communion also in terms of collaborative communion, mm. no? And this is a very collaborative project. It's a collaboration between you and the plants and the pollinators, but also collaboration between you and uh, many scientists, uh, uh, specialists in different fields. So I wanted to ask you, tell us a little bit about the Pollinator Pathmaker edition as a, a collaboration. So we, I mean, we're collaborating with the rain as well. <laughs> this is, it's a, a project about the natural environment. So 
to you. I'm not a gardener, and I think it's really important to state that, that I've come to this as an amateur. And the joy in my practice is talking to experts and asking them questions and coming as an outsider to their practice to creatively collaborate with them. So the, the garden, or living artwork, I should say, because it's not a garden, is designed using this algorithm that I wanted to use to create empathy. And this idea of a, a piece of computer code that can be empathetic is really challenging. So I began working with a, a string theory physicist who thinks in a very rational way. And he said, well, of course, we can make an algorithm that calculates for empathy, but what is empathy? And that was really the starting point of thinking about what this artwork could be and what it could do. So I had to define it in a really rational way, which was to think about um, maximizing pollinator diversity. But before I'd even got to that point, when I was thinking about what does it mean to be an insect and enjoy art, which opens up so many questions about aesthetics and beauty and evolution, I began sort of contacting scientists um, who knew a lot more about this than I did and also who maybe hadn't broached these questions from my perspective as an artist. So Lars Chitka, who's at Queen Mary's University of London, he sticks radars on the backs of bumblebees to look at how they travel around landscapes and also has just done work this year with bumblebees playing with balls to see if they play and if they have fun and if they can do things that don't have a food reward. And then I work with horticulturists at the Eden Project and beyond to start to think about what does a plant list look like for the algorithm to work with. So the algorithm is drawing from a database of plants that are all pollinator friendly, but each plant has been specifically chosen for the specific pollinators that visit it. So we were just looking at some of the foxgloves, which are in that bed behind you and they suit long-tongued bumblebees you know the bumblebee has to work hard to get inside the flower whereas um there's daisies somewhere are very easy to access because the the flower is sort of open so we have specialists and generalists and they start to form sort of the mass of of flowers and differences between flowers and plants um i learned from the beekeeper at the eden project um why, why flowers bloom at different times of the year, which isn't something I knew, is because their insect pollinators emerge at different times of the year. So you have what he described as these mutualistic pulses across landscapes as different flowers emerge and die over the cycle of the year. So sort of collating all of this information and all these conversations, which is the way I like to, to work, um, to have the opportunity to, to just ask people stuff, um, help to form the structure of this project. So at the beginning, I had the idea for an algorithm to buffer myself from my own aesthetic choices. And then it starts to sort of map out all these collaborations. So that was the creation of the plant list and the algorithm. The algorithm is optimizing pollinator diversity. And then the other side is getting this in the ground and the other gardens that were living artworks. I constantly have to correct myself because they're not gardens, because they're not for us. And I think we're going to talk a bit about what a garden is. Um, the bringing this into the park is a collaboration between so many different people. And I never imagined that I would see curators from the Serpentine digging holes in the park, which was such a pleasurable part of this, this installation. But it's a relationship with the Royal Parks and doing something very different, moving beyond the gallery and making a, a, a work in public like this. We have dogs. There's a very well-behaved dog over there, but we have dogs jumping across the fence. There's squirrels. There's all sorts of other users of the park interacting with it. So it's a collaboration between people, plants, insects, um, but ultimately we're here to look after it. And you mentioned before that the squirrels showed kind of unusual behavior. Yes, we... We're not meant to talk about the squirrels, but <laughs> the squirrels in Kensington Gardens seem to have a taste for alliums and chives, which are the plants you normally plant to keep squirrels away. And after we planted last May, there, were, there was evidence the next day that squirrels had been there because there were even, I even have a photo of a squirrel eating a freshly planted chive. Um, so I have a special relationship with squirrels now. <laughs> but it's meant to be a multi-species artwork, so we shouldn't discriminate. <laughs> Thank you. It's a very important point. <laughs> now, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about technology before we mm -hmm. then talk about gardens, because I mean, it's quote of Alexis Pauling Gams when she says, you know, that 
um, we have this opportunity now as a species fully in touch with each other to unlearn and relearn our own patterns of thinking, she of course refers to technology. And um, uh, in a way, the question is here, how can we use technology? Um, something also Itela Nan was always pointing out, you know, the, not for separation um, and not for isolation, but for communion uh, with each other and with our environment. Uh, and you have, of course, used technology for this um, pol pollinator project, which is not a garden. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I wanted to hear a little bit more about, about that and how you use technology in a way to actually create communion. And also, of course, particularly of interest is the way you use AI. I mean, there's mm -hmm. such a discussion now, so much more than when we started the project uh, and when you started to work in 2020. Uh, now AI is really at the forefront of the discussions. And uh, you, of course, see it as a kind of a collaboration. You collaborate with AI. How, how does that exactly work? Can you tell us? So I think it's, this artwork uses the technology. I'm trying to turn the technology around. So rather than using a technology to benefit humans, I'm asking the question, can the technology be altruistic? Can we actually, can humans make things that aren't for our benefits? Mm. And I think the answer is no, because everything we do is ultimately, everything we create, we dig a hole to create a thing. Um, so we're always destroying to create. And that is in our own interest. But here, by using the technology in a way that isn't for our aesthetic preference. Of course, we're indirectly helping ourselves because the insects themselves are supporting our ecosystems. But it's by making ugly gardens, which is what I hope we're doing here, um, the technology is not for us. But that's another problem is that we find this aesthetically pleasing. Flowers, for some reason, we've evolved to appreciate them. And we find this beautiful insects of a evolved to appreciate them. So bees are attracted to purple and yellow flowers because they can see them. They're not attracted to red flowers because they can't see red flowers. So finding in this project a way to use it positively was, was one of the questions. Here the technology is a tool to the end result which is printing a garden. But in other works I'm using technology in a much more critical way. So I perversely use a technology to understand it, to try and um, understand why we make it. Why do we focus on these new technologies rather than preserving everything around us that supports us? Why is the far off promise of a AI solution to climate change more important than actually doing something about it now? So in another work, um, machine auguries, I use the generative adversarial network to create artificial bird song. And it's not, that is not the solution to the problem of birds disappearing but it's a way to understand the technology better and understand the constraints and why we make it. They're still all very lucky with their umbrellas, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, we're going to get umbrellas too. Yeah, it's fine. I like gardening in the rain, so this is... <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in the countryside, so this is fine. <laughs> it's very luxurious. So I was also wondering um, about gardens, no? Because in 2011, we did the um, garden marathon at the, at the Serpentine, where we kind of looked at the garden between, you know, order and chaos. We, we looked at um, how the garden can be a metaphor for the interactions between human life, time, care, thought and space. And um, there's a lot of, for those of you who want to know more about it, there's a whole archive online about the Garden Marathon from 2011, involving, you know, lots of different uh, readings and lectures and performances. And uh, you often said, you know, ceci n'est pas un jardin, um, <laughs> to kind of quote the famous artwork. This is not a garden. Um, it's foremost an artwork. It's interesting, of course, that it's the artwork as a living organism, because I think there is a kind of an ontological change over the last couple of years that more and more artists are working in an analog physical way but also in a digital way on artworks as a living organism. I mean, we can see that with uh, all the artworks with simulations. You can see that with Ian Chang, for example, you know, which was the first artwork as a live simulation with AI, which we showed about five years ago at the Serpentine. And that artwork was basically a digital living organism. But we can also see it with all these artworks as mentioned before. Where artists are making farms, are making you know artworks which are 
living organism. So I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit more about the idea of the artwork as a living organism. Mm -hmm. It's not the first time you do that. You did that with previous works as well. And then also maybe explain to us pourquoi ceci n'est pas un jardin? <laughs> Why this is not yeah. a garden? Can I do it in English though? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think it's a lot of, I mean, the interest I have in creating a living artwork this time is that all my work over the last 10 years or more has been about lifelikeness. So whether it's using synthetic biology or artificial intelligence, I'm curious why humans manipulate life and why do we have this obsession all the way back from so the myth of the golem and even you know God creating Adam and Eve. Um, you know, what is this obsession with making life And here it's a very, you know, life here is the artwork, the interactions, the evolutionary interactions between bees and foxgloves is the artwork. But it's also a digital work um, in some ways, and it's also a time-based work. So as we've discovered, we planted this last summer and there was a very hot summer and the squirrels came as well and bits disappeared and were taken away and bits died and had to be replanted. And it, you know, it's taken a year to get to this stage and it will take another year to get to maturity. So it's a very slow artwork, but it also tells the story of, of a thing that lives in time as well as in space. So we think of gardens, you know, our own ability to sense time. We come to this park every day and we don't see it changing. We see the shift over seasons, but it's impossible to perceive the change that happens so fast. But if you're a bumblebee, what does that time look like? Your short life, what does that look like? So on the website that comes, that accompanies this, this artwork, pollinator.art, I've made a way to experience that garden over, over time. So there's an animation when you create a garden or living artwork, <laughs> you, um, can see those mutualistic pulses. You see flowers emerge, disappear, um, die over the year. And I think it's a really important way to look at the natural world is to see it in motion. So we don't see trees walking, but trees do walk. But they walk very slowly as, as they move and migrate. Um, we don't see these big patterns, but across biological and geological and evolutionary time, um, a living artwork really doesn't matter because it's the, the walking trees that we should be concerned about, especially with climate change, um, forcing species to move and migrate. That's some really good playing going on over there. <laughs> <laughs> I should have brought my dog. <laughs> um, You're amazing dog. <laughs> so Peanut helped plant a lot of this as well. So, so Peanut was a collaborator. Pe Peanut was a collaborator. He dug some holes um, while we were planting. But I think it's this idea of this as a simulation um, is another way of talking about it because it's an unnatural garden. Mm. It's designed for nature. Um, and so what is an unnatural garden? Well, these are plants that would never normally live together. They're from around the world. They've been chosen because they're locally appropriate, but they're not um, natural friends. They're also competing. So a garden, if left to its own devices, would tend to a monoculture. Uh, but here you've got healthy competition between all the different plants. So you're actually, it's a game, <laughs> a game in action, um, in living form. And I think the sort of thinking about it in that way as the sort of microcosm also is similar in a computer game or a digital world where you have a utopian world. This is a utopia, a garden is a form of utopia. But the artwork itself, this idea of having multiple editions of an artwork, each one local to a place, but that sits in a, in a series, in a context together. To me, my intention is to think about heterotopias. So parallel worlds, worlds that are different, not better or worse, but help us reflect back on our own world. So here we're, we're living through the eyes of the bees and the other insects. They are the audience for the artwork. We're watching them enjoy the artwork. And I'm trying to create the shift in perspective. So what does it mean for them to, to live in this ideal space? Um, everything has been chosen to cater for them, arranged to cater for the way they fly and forage. And it's sort of perfection um, in a very small space. But of course, it's completely unnatural and orchestrated by technology and by humans. Now, there is also an involvement of a number of uh, 
Did it stop? I'm going to be brave. <laughs> There's also a number of edible plants involved in the project, which, you know, often would be used by humans or approached by humans as, as crops to be planted, harvested, and, and ultimately also consumed. So I was kind of wondering also how can pollinate the pathmaker actually challenge, if that's somehow also something you thought mm -hmm. about and which is important for you to challenge our behavior sort of, um, in a way, towards uh, moving away from being consumers of art to be more being caretakers of art, maybe? Because it's interesting, I, I was friends with Felix Gonzalez Torres and he in the 90s, you know, did, did a lot of artworks where he always felt that the viewer had to take care of. And he always told me that he actually believes that we should not think of an artwork, you know, as a commodity, that we should not think of an artwork as something to be consumed but that we should think of an artwork like a plant we have to water every day. And this seems quite related to your practice. So there's a link maybe to Felix. That's really interesting. I think the, this terminology of, being, of caretaking and taking care is really important. The, you know, we're in a climate catastrophe that seems to be accelerating faster and faster. And this idea of coming together, collaborating and supporting the natural world is like our only way out of it. And I don't think there's even a way out, but it's a way to, to potentially temper it. Right. What's really kind of unusual about creating an artwork that's planted like this is, is the process. Sarah, who helped plant it, one of the curators here, um, was asking me, what's your favorite bit of the process? And the generation of the garden. So we have the area of the flower beds mapped out and then you kind of feed it into the machine and you press generate and you get a garden design and then you can do it again and again and again and it becomes addictive and you can have 500 which is what happened <laughs> and then you've got to choose which one and there's always bits that you don't like and bits that you do like but what you've got is not the artwork it's an instruction to make the artwork so it sort of sits in that space as well and if you go on pollinator.art and make your own you get an addition number, but the piece of paper that you can print out is not the artwork. It's, it's a fabrication instruction set. And the only way you can realize the artwork is by planting it. And once you've planted it, then you have this problem of keeping it alive. So I've planted one at home and I've learned to garden by doing this because I would never have done something so complicated in a flower bed with so many different plants. And now I have to look after it and I'm forced into this caretaking role. And taking care not to get stung by nettles as I weed it and trying to work out what's a friend, what's a weed. A weed, of course, is just a plant out of place. And wh what have I intentionally planted and what has arrived? And then I'm in this strange space of do I need to keep to the instructions or can I let things move around? Um, what does it mean for the artwork to not quite be the artwork that I intended? So there's all these strange questions come up about the consumption of it and the taking care of it. And I've described this also as the anti-NFT because um, it's fun when everyone else wants to make NFTs, but it's a question of value. Like an NFT is just a vehicle to accumulate value, financial value, and this is a different kind of value. This is thinking about what is an artwork worth? Why do we make them? Why do we consume them? We go into the gallery and we consume you know, it's coming into our eyes and it's making us think and it's giving us pleasure. But here, the pleasure has a slightly different sense. It's the, the self-congratulation of keeping it alive <laughs> and allowing it, other species to enjoy it. And of course, it's kept alive here, but it's also kept alive in Berlin. And um, it started there actually in June and has been alive now for a month uh, in the Natural History Museum in Berlin, we had quite a lot of conversations with them, uh, with the museum in Berlin. Um, and it's, of course, a very, very different context because a natural history museum is, of course, um, a place which um, has so much to do with the theme of extinction. Um, it's also in Berlin, actually, the gathering place of the Friday's future, as the director explained to us, uh, you know, movement where we very often gather there. And, um, and, and I mean, extinction has been very much uh, a topic for you 
early on. It's also how we met through the research we did for, you know, for Back to Earth. And, uh, and of course, our entire ecology work at the Serpentine started about 15 years ago with Gustav Metzger. It started really thanks to mm -hmm. Gustav Metzger, the pioneering artist who has to be mentioned here. We did a retrospective with him first, a group show a retrospective. And each time when we opened a project with him, he basically came to our office the next day and he said, you know, it has only just begun. We need to do more in relation to the extinction crisis. And that led then to the extinction marathon, led to the fact that we made ecology, you know, very central at the Serpentine and, and permanent, not only project-based, et cetera, et cetera. And, and in a way, uh, Gustav's um, credo was always that we need to talk not about climate change, but we need to change language and talk about extinction. And he insisted on this language of extinction. He also did a big project, uh, education project, where um, many, many students uh, nice. all over the UK would cut out from newspapers um, digitally and analog, you know, find articles related to extinction and kind of build an archive. Now, can you talk a little bit about this theme, which mm -hmm. in, a, in a very strong way, like in your work, mm -hmm. is anchored like it is in Gustav's? I mean, think about the rhino. That's the story of, uh, of extinction. I'm fascinated by archives because they show us what we value and what we collect and how Western, modern, scientific, enlightenment thought has structured the world. So you're exactly right. The Natural History Museum in Berlin, the same as the one here, is a mausoleum. It's full of millions and millions of dead animals pinned to, you know, butterflies pinned in boxes with pins through them, dinosaur skeletons. It's the very strange kinds of archives. Um, I work with the Natural History Museum here in London uh, for an exhibition called The Lost Rhino, which I curated that was um, ran from the end of last year. And there was a taxidermied rhino in this exhibition, and this was a really extraordinary object. And to include in, an art, in a, a curated art exhibition in that context, because to me it's not a rhinoceros and the exhibition I curated was about the idea of the rhinoceros and how right the rhino lives on in our imagination it doesn't matter if it lives or not in the real world it's so embedded as an icon of knowledge and the enlightenment ever since Dürer's rhinoceros in 1515 it's captivated us as the symbol of both the unknown and the the thing that we can catalog but moving a taxidermied rhino around the museum proved to be kind of an extraordinary challenge and really interesting because it revealed all the political and social structures of display and sort of ideas within a museum around what nature is. So in a way, the nicest um, argument that we had at the museum was that they were worried that I was using this rhinoceros as a prop. Um, and it's obviously this majestic animal that once lived and this particular rhinoceros in South Kensington was, was killed and collected in 1896 for the museum. But it's a skin that's been preserved. It's actually been painted with emulsion paint to make it look more dramatic. And it's just draped over an armature that's stuffed with, they don't actually know, it's probably straw or paper. And it's not an animal. It's a, a bag, <laughs> like a skin bag of an animal. And I said, well, it is a prop. You know, this is exactly what it is. It stands in. It's, it's an artifact that we use to represent the rhinoceros. And in the same way in Berlin, the Natural History Museum is this collection, a collection of things that tell us about the world, but through our own lens. So it was so important to me to have something living in front of the museum. And I think that's why the museum is so excited about it as the collaboration because it becomes not only a beautiful sight of flowers, carpeting was quite a sad space, but it's living before you go and see the dead stuff. And it's also a site of experimentation and learning. So the, the museum scientists are starting to catalog what they're identifying. And it's something we want to do here as well with the Royal Parks is actually doing a study to see if this algorithm works, if it does maximize pollinator diversity and we've, we're doing similar research at the Eden project with scientists from Exeter University and it's this idea of the archive as a living thing or a different way of thinking about what an archive can be something that's more porous that can spread across landscapes to me is very powerful um, and a different way of presenting 
the cataloging of the world that humans have been obsessed with over the last 500 years. Thank you so much. And maybe it would be great to hear also a little bit about, um, as none of us have, uh, I, I suppose, I haven't seen it, I suppose. I mean, who has been to Berlin? Has any one of you seen the Polynesian mm. So no one has seen, yeah, we have yeah, one person. Yeah. <laughs> Two, three. Uh, it just, we just planted it. So. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it would be great, as most of us haven't seen it, to hear a bit about how different it is from, from London. Because mm. you, I mean, I think it's important that we're also no longer talking here about, that's also changing, you know, there was this idea that the project would tour. Mm. One would have, a, one would talk about touring exhibitions and that's nothing else than homogenized globalization. You basically have an exhibition in a local context and you tour it to the next city and don't take the context of the next city into account. So, so in a way, I think we need to no longer use that language of a touring show. I think an exhibition uh, or a project, as a matter of fact, is not an exhibition, nor is it a garden. It's a living, and a hard work is a living organism. So this hard work as a living organism is obviously a very different one when it grows in Berlin. And, you know, as you said, the, the planting is very connected to the local context. Can you tell us a little bit about how the two gardens differ? So, so on a visual um for a human visual <laughs> description, the garden, sorry, the living artwork, and I didn't actually answer, I was like, what is it, <laughs> why is it not living artwork? Um, is there it's one big solid sort of mass. It's a traditional forecourt of a traditional 19th century building. And it's, we've just created a, a carpet across one, one sort of unified space, whereas here we're sitting amongst 11 beds that's threading through existing planting. But I think, it both are created using locally appropriate plantness. So the way the, the project as a whole works is that in each new region that the project appears in, through the first commission, we create a new plantness that's appropriate for the area. So the Berlin plantness sort of covers a lot of continental Europe. The plants here cover um, are appropriate for the UK and lots of northern Europe. So we've got this sort of difference in those plantless themselves and then the site is different so the kind of soil composition here in a, a shady space and so the plants that the algorithm chooses are different in each location and that's something you can play with as well and see how it works on pollinator.art but I think there's also to me this really important notion of one of the ambitions that I have in a megalomaniac sort of way which is to create the world's largest climate positive artwork and there's sort of one problem and one positive <laughs> with this idea. And one is, I don't know what a climate positive artwork is. And it's something that we're embarking on in the studios to actually try yeah. and define that and to find a way to um, quantify. But the positive side of that is that we think of these editions as separate things. So that's the Cornwall edition, the Serpentine edition, the Berlin LAS edition. But each of those gardens um, or each of those sites, the idea is that it seeds a local network of DIY additions. So from the website, anyone can make their own, get their instructions, plant it, and they start to join up into a network. And so you no longer have the LAS edition. It becomes Berlin because all these gardens are, are supporting each other. There's, the whole network becomes one artwork. And that's because the insects are traveling between them. They're stealing bits of the artwork. They're bringing new bits. There's mm. plants that are dying, plants that are, you know, the insects are helping the plants have sex. So that's a, a very important part of this. So some plants flourish, some don't. So all of them ultimately, if we could do this everywhere, it becomes one, one artwork. It's not, they're not separately localized additions. It's a, a growing, um, network across a landscape. And again, that challenges the idea of what a garden is um, because we think about gardens as these isolated utopias, these spaces that we create. Yeah. And instead, it's a porous, leaky space across a landscape. That's almost like a wonderful conclusion. I wanted to ask you one last thing. When we visited yesterday uh, the studio, uh, your studio, Rissan, with Costas, it was incredibly impressive to see a whole new body of work that you actually started to make watercolors uh, of living artworks, of uh, living organisms, of plants. Can you tell us about this new 
about this new practice? Yeah, so for this project, I drew all the plants in the database across all the seasons. Um, so I've, in the end, done about 600 drawings or paintings, and I used the iPad to paint them all. But I had, when I started doing it, I hadn't actually painted since I was 18. So it was a big jump for me to do this in a very public way. And now I want to start um, sort of being tentatively at home, starting to play, um, trying to find a way to also express these same ideas, but without the digital tool. So what does it, when I look at the garden, my garden at home, what is the pollinator seeing? I have three dimensional color what is an insect with 15 dimensional color seeing? And I have no way to express that. Um, can you imagine if you could see 15 dimensions or so 12 more be beyond red, green and blue? What does the world look like? So I have no idea how to represent it <laughs> in paint, but it's something that I'm sort of starting to think about is how does it, um, how can using that medium as well tease out some of the ideas? So Lars Chitka, the scientist at Queen Mary's, he um, showed me an experiment that he did a long time ago with another artist where he put, I think it was Van Gogh's sunflowers next to a Patrick Caulfield print and to see which one the bees migrated to. And they all went to the sunflowers, which is, <laughs> I don't know what it can actually tell us, but it's um, this idea of trying to get into the world of these insects. There the insects are choosing human art, but how in a way can we shift that round and think about creating for them or trying the impossible which is to get into their their world their experience of the world but i don't know the answer so that's why i'm starting yeah but it's a great description because they really are multi-dimensional watercolors but what is your and that's my very last question what is your unrealized projects because we know a great deal about architects unrealized projects mm -hmm. because they publish them as part of competitions but we know very little about artists unrealized projects so i was wondering if you can tell us maybe about one of your favorite unrealized yeah. projects, dreams. Uh, well, you were just interviewing a bee on one of those flowers asking on the allium. Um, and I was saying that the bee is, is enjoying its unrealized project, which is the food in that flower. Uh, it's having the ultimate aesthetic experience. Um, and that's really what I, I think I want to start looking at next is how I'm delving into this world of uh, insect perception and this idea of the umwelt of the insect, the entire world experience. And there's no way for us to step into their, their experience of the world. So what are the ways they're communicating between each other? How are, you know, plants are talking to insects, they're making sounds, they're releasing electric charges that the insects can sense, they're finding all these different strategies to communicate. And I, that's um, this, this ultrasonic meadow is where I want to dive into next i think thank you so much it's the moment where we can open it up we can take maybe two or three questions if you have questions i've got a question here i was wondering if you were gonna ever um develop it further maybe into blue spaces or like areas of marshland and talk about different types of pollinators instead of just like bumblebees and more on land creatures and maybe talking about blue spaces and um, like species extinction in other areas. Well, I don't know about pollinators and oh, so you mean in the ocean or you just mean in marshlands and marshland, lakes like rivers. I haven't uh, I think each would need a new plant list so I'm hoping that our next step with pollinator pathmaker will be to go to the US and to create plant a plant list there for one region because every region is different. It's so it's so complex. But there we have different kinds of pollinators. There's birds, hummingbirds, um, bats are pollinators, mammals are pollinators as well of certain plants. So there's, in a way, you could do any region where there are plants in need of someone to help them have sex. Uh, a lot of plants are wind pollinated, so they're, they're fine. But I'm really curious, yeah, the marsh, a marsh specific list um, would be very interesting but I don't know which I don't know much about marsh grasses because they're all wind pollinated but there must be other things lurking that would be very interesting can take another question or comment 
Uh, I was wondering if you have any documentation about the pollinization and the effect in, in the garden, what, how these insects be, you know, have sex, what happens here. So I mentioned we were trying to do, embark on scientific research that would establish um, which pollinators, but not just identification, but how they're moving across the landscape. But I think there's a lot out there that you can find around. I mean, I am particularly fascinated by the specificity. So a bumblebee's long tongue. Um, one of our horticultural advisors described that you need uh, different shaped flowers for different shaped mouth parts. And I love that idea of your mouth parts um, determining your interactions with the world. So I think, I, you know, again, I'm not an expert on this, but the thing that you can do is to watch. And that's the pleasure, is <laughs> sitting there staring and trying to understand. I mean, I've, the one I've planted at home, that's the joy, is just actually looking for the first time and not just looking at bees because the flowers here are catering for bees and wasps and moths and ants and beetles who all have different strategies. And it's interesting to see which plants there's different species on and which ones are attracting one and how their mouth parts are interacting <laughs> with the flower. Um, but there's so much we can't see as well because there's UV markings on the plants that we can't see, but the insects can. So, um, you know, there's, the sex is happening, but we can't, like, it's not in our world or our language. <laughs> And take a last question. If there is no last question, I do have a last question. I was kind of wondering, um, Rainer Maria Rilke wrote this little book, you know, which is an advice to a young poet. I was kind of wondering what would be your advice to a young artist or art student who works at the intersection of art, technology, ecology. Uh, well, I would still like to be a young artist, but <laughs> I think I'm past it. I think for me, what's been so important in my practice is collaboration and going and asking questions and finding my ways into labs and seeing the world from other perspectives. And I think there's a real balance between the sort of confidence to do that and the the beautiful position of not knowing and and sort of coming from a very honest place because the key to all of this is collaboration. I think what's interesting about this model of the project and relates to the question about touring is that we're asking all these institutions to join in mm. no one is more special than anyone else it's, it counters the way um museums and galleries operate that they want to be the first that's how you get people in and here the value is coming together and i think that's how practice works well in this space of ecology and environment is there is no single solution. There's no, one person won't solve it. It's through agency and collaboration. So I think that kind of practice is really helpful in the space and that kind of attitude. And the other thing is just sheer stubbornness and tenacity. And just, you've got your vision and you just make it happen. <laughs> Amazing. And not being shy about it. Thank you so, so much. A big round of applause for Alexander Daisy Ginsburg. Thank, thank you. Thank you for letting us do this.